All right, in today's video, I'm going to be extending my home Wi-Fi network. A little bit about my house. I have a very long house, and I get Wi-Fi in the main area of the house because the router is right here. But there's a section of my house, the garage and a room above the garage, that I do not get Wi-Fi. And it's been driving me nuts. I'd really like to get Wi-Fi in the garage for many reasons. The way I see it, you have four options, and I'm going to go over them right now. First option is you could call your internet service provider and you could have them install another router in the area of your house or garage or wherever that you do not get access, Wi-Fi. So if you go that route, you're going to probably be paying additional fees and it's going to cost you more money. I didn't want to go that route. A second option is you can go online and you can buy a Wi-Fi repeater system. So basically a Wi-Fi repeater system works in that you have your main router probably in the main central area of your house and then you have these little repeaters that plug into outlets in your house. I've heard a lot of mixed reviews about them. I've heard a lot of people say that they do get Wi-Fi in the areas of their, their house that they normally wouldn't but the connection is slower. Some people say that the electromagnetic frequencies that the Wi-Fi repeater throws off messes with their system. So a lot of mixed reviews. I didn't want to go that route. You know, you can do your own research and, and see if it looks right for you. Another option, and this is the option that I was deeply considering going, but the cost was just too high. So for those of you that have never heard of Ubiquity, Ubiquity is a networking company and they make some really nice products. So Ubiquity makes these round pucks and you'll see them a lot in commercial buildings and they're called access points. They're normally mounted on the ceiling and they look like really large flat smoke detectors almost and they have a little halo in there, normally a blue ring when they're connected to your network. So each of these access points cost around $150. I was looking at buying two of them and I thought that would be a great system. Great, It really is a great network but it's expensive so I was going to buy two of these Ubiquity access points but the problem with just buying the access points is that there is no firewall. The router that I have and pretty much all routers have firewalls built into them and it's really important to have a firewall because that helps to prevent hackers from getting into your home network so I mean if you have video cameras in your house stuff like that and you just buy these access points and you don't have any kind of firewall it makes it very easy for outside hackers to get in and you know look at your surveillance cameras so you can buy a firewall through Ubiquity that connects to these access points and that's highly recommended. So by the time you buy the access points, the firewall, and the firewall does require some programming, which I'm not the best at programming, I'm sure I could have figured it out. And of course, then you would have had to buy all the other supplies that you see here, the Cat6 cable, crimper, all this. You know, I was looking at spending around $900 to $1,000 on a Ubiquity access system and I would have loved to have it, but just the cost was too high and I was a little bit nervous about the programming for that system. All right, so what is your fourth option? Well, this is your fourth option. So this is a cool trick, which I, I learned about this recently. Your existing router has ports in the back of it and you can actually tie into those ethernet ports and you can actually connect another router to your main router and basically daisy chain them together to extend your Wi-Fi network. This is an old router that was just laying around the house, not being used, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tie this old router into the new router. It's gonna take some work, definitely, and here's what you need to do in order to do that, and that's what I'm gonna be doing in this video. You need to basically connect your new router to your old router, and the way you connect it is via Cat5e or Cat6 cable. Cat6 cable is better just because it has higher speeds and it's you know the more modern option. So again, we're going to need to take this Cat6 cable, run it from the new router to the old router, and you're going to need some stuff in order to do that. And depending on the length of cable run, you may need to get a network switch or PoE switch. So let's go over what I have on the table here. Of course, I have the Cat6 cable, a thousand feet, and you will see that there are not connectors on here. That is because I need to make custom cable lengths. So in order to do that, you're gonna need custom cable making tools. You're gonna need 
a kit like this. This is made by Klein Tools, which Klein, really great company, makes some really high-end tools for those of you that don't know. And this is a data cable installation kit. So we have a crimper, we have a punch tool, and then this is a stripper right here. So when dealing with Cat6 cable, there's really two main connections that we're gonna be dealing with. First off is just your standard plug-in connections, which that's what's in this box right here. These are just your plug-in connections. And that's where we would use the crimp tool and there's a very specific way that the wires need to go into these connectors. So there's that. And then also what I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna need to cut a hole in the drywall over here. And I'm gonna need to install this low voltage box and this four port cover. And then these are the terminals where the Cat6 cable connects and then these terminals plug into this cover right here. So in order to connect the Cat6 cable to these, uh, I'll call these female terminals, we're gonna need this punch tool right here and which I'll, I'll go over that when we get there. So I've covered this stuff. This right here is a PoE switch, which PoE stands for power over ethernet. So when you're running this Cat6 cable long distances, there's an electrical charge in that cable and with these long distances, you may need to add power to that Cat6 cable in order to keep the signal strength up. And the way you can um, add power to the cable over long distances is by using a PoE switch, and they also have things called PoE injectors. And basically, after you install a connection on your Cat6 cable, you will plug that in into this switch, and this switch is plugged into the wall, and this basically injects power back into that cable to increase the strength for the distance of Cat6 cable that you run. So I mean, if you run 150 feet of Cat6 cable, you're definitely gonna need a PoE injector or PoE switch. I've done enough talking here. I think you know this is gonna be a pretty long video, but for those of you that are really looking to do a project like this, I think this video will help you out a lot, so stick with me. So the first thing that you need to do and that you need to understand before you even buy all this stuff is you need to understand that you're gonna need to route this cable from your new router to your old router. And before you attempt to do this project, take a good look at your house. Understand if it's even possible for you to run this Cat6 cable from one end of your house to the other end of your house. I'm fortunate in that the very upstairs I have an attic, so if I find a way to bring the cable all the way up into the attic, I can carry that cable all over the house. And I'm also fortunate in that below me is the basement and the basement has a drop ceiling which it's actually part right now because I'm re redoing the ceiling but I have a drop ceiling so I'm able to access the floor underneath where I am. So as long as I can get this cable from the drywall down to the floor below and up into that ceiling I can run it, I can run this Cat6 cable anywhere I, that I need to in the house. So please understand that you need to know that you can run the cable throughout the length of your house. So you, you need to determine that before you really make a decision. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my level, I'm gonna put it on the top of this cover plate, and I'm gonna get that bubble right there in between those two lines. That's right about there. Hold this in place, then I'm gonna take a pencil and lightly score the drywall. And this will just give me a reference where the top of this cover plate is so I can match it over here. It's a pretty heavy score line. Which I'd say right about there is going to be fine. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my scratch hole and I'm actually going to push this into the drywall. And this does two things. This holds this in place for a moment and this also references where the mounting plate screw hole goes. And it's a good idea to take your level again if you want to get it perfect. Put it up along the side of this plate. Just make sure that's level. So while you're holding that, take your scratch hole and mark out the bottom hole. So, again, you can do this with a marking device, but a punch or scratch hole I think works a bit better. So we have our two mounting holes poked or marked. All right, so I tried marking this out the first time and I actually marked it out incorrectly. I'm gonna explain how to mark it out correctly. So this top line is correct because we matched the height of this cover plate with our Cat6 
cover plate, and that is fine. And where I punch these holes, those are proper. Those are in the right locations. Now, if you look at your mounting box, your mounting plate, you will see that there is an oval hole at the top, and there's, hopefully you can see this, there's an over, oval hole at the top, and there's two rectangular holes on the sides, on either side, and then another oval at the bottom. And what we're going to be marking out, we're going to be marking out this flange, and what you're going to need, you're going to need a very fine, long-tipped pen, or a sharpie, or something along that sort. And basically what we're going to do, to the right of this screw and to the left of this screw, we're going to line up these holes that we punched on the wall. So this hole right here, line it up with the hole right here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to stick my head in front of the camera for a second, make sure that top hole is lined up perfectly. And I know for certain that top hole is lined up perfectly. I'm going to double check with the level to make sure that this is properly level because once we start cutting, and there's no turning back. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my very fine sharpie and this oval hole in the top, on the bottom of this oval hole, I'm just going to make a little mark, like so. And then these square or rectangular holes on the side, I'm going to make a little mark right there, a little mark on the right. Do the same thing on the left side. I'm going to stick my head in the camera for a second. I know you can't really see this. And the top of the oval hole on the bottom. And again, this is just marking out the flange. So pay no attention to the uh, <laughs> the pencil marks that you see right here. But you can see there's a mark right here from my pen. Mark here, mark here, mark here, and mark here. Those are the lines that we're going to follow. So what you're going to do now is you're going to take your level, line those up. Draw a straight edge. Draw a straight line, rather. It's not the prettiest, but I understand where I need to cut. I need to cut on this outer line. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a razor knife and I'm going to score the proper line that I just made, which, again, that's going to be the outer line. And take your time doing this. Try and get it right on the mark if you can. All right, so first thing we need to determine is where we're going to put our Cat6 junction box. And I want to put it right next to this coax cable. This coax feet cable comes from the outside world and this connects to our modem. Now it's a good idea to have a stud finder because when you're installing this low voltage junction box you want to make sure that you do not put it directly on a stud. But if you don't have a stud finder and you have a nearby junction box for like a coax cable what you can do is simply take the cover plate off and that's what I've done get yourself a flashlight then you can shine the flashlight in the hole and look around and see if you can find a stud. For this box I see that there's a stud directly to the right of it which there's a stud right here and you can actually kind of hear it see that sound solid there and the sound changes a little bit right there so you could do the old knock method too but it's you know of course better if you can actually take a look behind there or get a stud finder. So I've determined that this is a good location to install the box also, something important that you need to do if you're able to take out a pre-existing junction box is try and get the flashlight in the hole and look down and see if there's anything down there that you have to worry about when we start drilling. So in order to run my Cat6 cable, I'm going to need to take that cable and I'm going to need to go into the basement. There's no access holes from this coax cable. This coax cable actually goes up. It doesn't go straight down. So I'm going to need to drill a hole through the floor behind the wall into the basement. And it's also really important that before I drill this hole, I need to go downstairs and try and get a pretty good understanding of where this is. Maybe measure off a corner over here and then measure off a corner over there. So try and triangulate where this hole is going to be drilled downstairs to make sure I'm not drilling into any water lines, any pipes, or any electrical lines. So I've gone downstairs and I see nothing in the way of me drilling a hole down here. Here is the drill bit I have, which this thing is massive. Uh, I believe this is a half inch drill bit and this is 72 inches, which is a really long, really long drill bit. It's still going. So this is going to be critical in helping me to drill access holes to run my cable. All right, so of course, in order to install this low voltage box, what I'm going to do, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put this cover plate back on and then from there I'm going to take a level and I'm going to, of course, get the level level 
I'm gonna mark out to the left of this junction box where this cover plate's gonna go, and I'll show you what we do from there. Now I'm gonna take my drywall hole saw that I picked up at a yard sale for 75 cents, and I'm gonna go over where I just scored with the razor knife. Absolutely perfect. Now I'm gonna go ahead and install this mounting plate and again, the way this works is there's little tabs in the back that flip up when you tighten down the screw, or well, you actually have to stick it in there, flip it up, and then you can start tightening down the screw, which this screw is just a number two Phillips. And we'll do the same thing on the bottom. Before I completely tighten the screws, one more time, I'm gonna take my level. Make sure this box is plumb and level. So now that I have that junction box installed, I'm gonna take my very long 72 inch drill bit. I'm gonna sneak this back in the wall here. And as you can see that I have my headlight in the coax cable junction box just to give me a little bit of light. So I'll drill here and we'll see if we can find where this comes out downstairs. Okay, feels like it, I just made it through all the way. So let's take the camera downstairs and see if we can find where this drill bit went through the floor. And there's drill bit came out right next to that joist. Perfect. All right, so I got that hole drilled through the floor behind the wall and I'm happy where that landed. Now, I just got back from being in the basement and I drilled a second hole next to that first hole. What my plans are, I'm gonna do two Cat6 runs from this point to the garage. One of them is gonna be a dedicated network line and the second Cat6 run is gonna be for a future home surveillance network system. So, another thing to think about when you're doing this, I'm planning on doing a drywall ceiling in my basement in the future. And yes, you can put in access panels, but you know if you're doing a project like this, it's a good idea to think about putting pull strings in and additional holes in the floor for future lines that you wanna pull through the floor. So, of course, right now I'm definitely doing the two lines to the garage. That should be all I ever need, but I'm also going to install a pull string that's gonna tie on the back of this junction box and it's gonna go through the floor. So when I have my finished ceiling, I can still utilize that pull string and pull additional network lines to this box if I ever need to in the future. So now the fun part, the thing that stinks, I did grab a thousand feet of cable, which that's gonna be plenty to do two runs from here to the garage. However, I'm gonna to have to do one run at a time. I'm gonna to have to pull this one all the way to the garage I'm going to have to cut the line and then I'm going to have to come back up here and do the same thing again through the same route, which I'll have all the holes done by then, but it just kind of stinks that I can't pull both these lines through at one point because this is a spool and I don't want to unspool it. It just it wouldn't be fun. All right, enough jabbering. All right, there's where the cable came out. It came out of the first hole and you can see the second hole that I drilled right there. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this cable, this Cat6 cable, I'm gonna run it through the joist this way. It's gonna go down that way and then eventually go to the garage that way. Now, it's important that when you're running any kind of lines, electrical lines, Cat6 lines, whatever, through these joists, if you have my style of joist, which is like this particle board, glued, modern style joist, make sure you go through these pre-engineered punch-out holes. Do not just start drilling random holes in these joists. Like you see there's another pre-engineered hole right there. Go through those holes, don't drill random holes. All right, so my first cable run is complete and I will tell you the first cable run is gonna be the hardest because you have to figure out where to route all the cable and you gotta put all the holes in and it's just, it's not a fun process. So I'll take you over the whole run real quick. So first it comes down from behind the wall through the floor right there. Then it goes through that floor joist all right, so the Cat6 cable comes out on the other side of the floor joist there, goes down along this channel, 
And what you'll see in a moment here is that every 10 to 15 feet, I have these big loops and I call these pull loops. So by having these big pull loops, if I need more slack going that way, I can pull some slack right here. Then you can see how I have this run. Then I'll go down to the next pull loop right here and then I can pull at the slack from the loop that I've left over there and then just keep passing on that slack further down the line as we go on. Now what I plan to do is I'm going to take this cable, it's already ratted into the garage, so after I make my connections in the garage, then I'm going to reverse pull the slack, so I'm going to pull the slack out back this way, and I'm going to start properly hanging this cable the rest of the way. As you can see, it's just hanging along the block wall in there. But another thing to note upon is this is unshielded wire, but Cat6 cable is actually pretty good at not having any electrical interference. But I did look up the code and code states that if you have telecommunication lines running parallel alongside wires, telecommunication lines need to be spaced at least two inches away from any electrical lines. Now I wanted to be much further away from electrical lines because if you have telecommunication lines like next to electrical lines, there may be some interference and therefore that diminishes your signal that, di that diminishes the performance of your CAT6 cable. So as you can see, for the most part, I have that CAT6 cable spaced well away from any electrical lines with the exception right there. We're probably, you know, a foot away from electrical lines up there. And it's just, you know, in its own run, try to keep it as far away from electrical lines as possible. Now, if you look right here, I'm gonna have to cross paths with the electrical lines running parallel to the block wall. Why are we out of focus here? But yes, so if you have a T intersection where the electrical lines are running one way, and then you have the CAT6 cable running perpendicular to your electrical lines, that two inch spacing requirement is no longer, a, no longer necessary rather. So if you have a T intersection, you can have the CAT6 go right up against your electrical lines. This is where the CAT6 cable exits the crawl space and enters the garage. And by no means is this the prettiest or most proper way to do this, but this was just quick and convenient. So as you'll see here, this CAT6 is not two inches away from electrical lines, but that's okay because code says that if the electrical lines are in conduit, then you can have CAT6 cable right up alongside the electrical lines which this won't be for too long. This cat six just has to run down along the corner here. But anyway, I don't like having exposed holes like that. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm just gonna take some spackle after I run my second cat six cable and I will close up that hole so no bugs or creatures can enter the crawl space. Anyway, the cat six cable is gonna run along that conduit, unfortunately for about 15, 20 feet. And then here's what I'm thinking. The cat six cable is gonna come up along this shelf right here and I'm gonna make kind of like a junction area up here. So I have my PoE network switch right here and there are actually screw holes on the bottom. So if I wanna mount this thing on top of the plywood shelf, I think that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna mount it up here and I'm gonna have a network switch for the ethernet and then the second line coming in the garage up here is gonna be for my PoE home surveillance system, which that will definitely be coming in the future. So now that we have one cable run, I need to finish that cable via terminations. Now for CAT6 cable, we're gonna use RJ45 connectors, and they are gonna look something like this. Here is a case of RJ45 connectors, and RJ45 connectors are designed for CAT6 cable. Something additional that you could use, which I decided to purchase was these little protective covers and these just help prevent the uh, CAT6 cable from bending at those male connection points. Okay, so what about the wall plate? How do you terminate CAT6 wire at the wall plate? Well, you use something called a keystone jack and that looks something like this, which I'm going to show you how to do this all in a minute here. But with the keystone jack, cable just sits in here and then you follow the instructions on the side of the keystone jack as to which wire goes where. Again, we'll do that in a second here. And then also, keystone jack comes with a little dust cover. 
So how do you know what order to put the wires into the keystone jack or your RJ45 connector? When it comes to the RJ45 connector, there are really two different ways that you could wire this. And the two different ways are T568B, which nine times out of 10, that is the way that these connections are made. There's also another type of connection called a T568A. We're gonna stick with the T568B because it's more common. And I'll give you a close up right here so you can see what I'm talking about. So we're just gonna follow that color coding for the T568B. So if you plan to do this, I recommend that you get a, uh, well, you're gonna need some type of termination toolkit. I decided to go with the Klein toolkit and uh, I've tested it out once already and I'm pretty happy with the crimper. Crimper does a nice job, it has these wire cutters in here, also comes with this cable stripping tool which we'll use in a second here, and also a manual punch down tool, meaning that when you push down on this, it's not spring loaded, you just have to force the wires down into this keystone jack, which I'm not a huge fan, I'd prefer spring loaded, but you know what, it, it works, it'll do the job. All right, so the first thing we're gonna need to do is strip back some of the protective jacket. So with this Klein tool stripper, or jacket stripper, you just push down on this little button like so. We're gonna go in maybe two inches, one loop, two loops. Push down, remove that jacket stripping tool, and then just wiggle it from side to side, and then you remove the protective jacket. Now while we're in here, I'm just gonna separate the wires for a second. I'm gonna cut and cut back this fiberglass stranding. I think this is fiberglass stranding or whatever it is. We don't need that, and also this separator in the middle here, we're gonna cut that out of there. I'm gonna use the cutting end of the Klein crimper tool. All right, so that should be fine. Now the next thing we're gonna need to do is determine what type of connector we're gonna do. Obviously we're doing the RJ45, and uh, from here, I could have done this earlier, but you're gonna wanna take your boot if you're using boots slide that down there now because we're going to use that boot later. Now what we need to do is just start separating these wires and I watched a guy on YouTube and he used a piece of protective jacket to go down along these wires and he just separated them like so. It seems to work out pretty well. You could also just untwist these by hand but you know just keep the colors together for now and we'll untwist them. Okay so we have all the individual wires separated now we're gonna to need to start putting them in order. So we're gonna follow the chart right here for the T56B RJ45 connector. So the first wire is gonna be orange and white. So I'm, I'm gonna show you what the easiest way to do this is because I actually used to make these cables. It was one of my first jobs. So I'm gonna take the orange and white and then I'm just gonna keep lining these up and pinching these wires with my finger. So orange and white, orange. Next is gonna be green and white after green and white is going to be solid blue. What I'm doing is I'm just wiggling these a little bit to take some of the waves in the cable out of these individual lines. So after blue is going to be blue and white, followed by green, white and brown, and then brown. Then just keep solid pressure with your thumb and index finger. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to work these cables while keeping them in order. I'm just going to work them a little bit from side to side, up and down. And what I'm trying to do is just straighten them out a little bit. Like so. You can kind of see how they're all straightened out a bit right now. I think you can see that okay. So I'm going to check one more time to make sure they're in the proper order. White, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white and blue, solid green, white and brown and brown. So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some type of cutting device. I'll take the cutters on this crimp tool and I'm gonna come down and where all these wires look the straightest, I'm actually gonna cut them off just like that. And you see how nice and straight they are right now? That's gonna make it a breeze to install this RJ45 connector. So if you followed the order in which I instructed you to put these wires together, what you're gonna do now is take your RJ45 clip, 
And where you have the clip side, we're gonna have that face the back and we're just gonna take this RJ45 connector and we're just gonna slide it right down along those wires. The wires are gonna pass through and look at that. Beautiful. I'm gonna keep pushing this up a little bit, try and get some of the jacket inside the RJ45 connector if possible. And if you want, you could check one more time to make sure that you have everything in the proper order. White and green, white, blue, green. Yes, okay, so everything is still in the proper order. Now we're gonna take our crimp tool, and for my crimp tool, there are two different ports. One is smaller, that's for Cat5 cable, I believe, possibly Cat5e, I think it's just Cat5 cable. But we're gonna go into the larger crimp port. So all you do is take your cable, your crimp connector, you see it'll only go in there one way. So just insert it in the tool like so, Put a little downward pressure on the Cat6 cable and crimp. I like to crimp a second time just to make sure. You can even crimp it a third time if you want. And that's that. So this is properly crimped now. Now the final thing we need to do is cut off the ends of the wires. Because this is considered a pass-through connector. Pass-through wire connector. So we need to cut off the ends of these wires. Now this is where the client tools crimper falls short because I've tried to cut off these wires like really close to the head of this RJ45 connector and this Klein tools crimper it just it, it doesn't do the job. I've tried, I'll try it again right now like what the instructions say you do you put it in here like so you crimp down and I mean some of them come off that, that wasn't too bad maybe I'll try that one more time wasn't working too well earlier Yeah, it's really not working out too well. So I'd recommend that you have a really nice pair of scissors or some type of really fine cutter tool. Which I'm just gonna use this cutter tool right here and then just cut these wires as close to the head as possible. Okay, so all the wires are cut on the end of this connector. Now the final thing to do is just take your protective boot and we'll slide that up over the clip like so and that is how you make an RJ45 connection with a pass-through style connector and I'm very confident in that connector so now we're gonna move to the other side and we're gonna do a what is this called again a keystone jack connection so we're gonna start off the same way we're gonna take our jacket stripping tool we're gonna push that down Again, about two inches, maybe that's a little bit more than you need. Go around twice, take out the protective jacket, I'm going to separate the strands a little bit here, and we're just going to cut off little hairs in there and that other plastic divider. And then same thing from here, we're going to take a piece of jacket. We're gonna split these wires up. All right, so how do you route the wires in a keystone jack? Well, it's gonna depend on the jack because different manufacturers may label these colors slightly differently. You will see that there is a B level and then the lower side of the jack is an A level. So because we decided that we're going with the more common T568B wiring diagram, we're gonna stick with the upper level because that is the B level. So in order to wire this, we're gonna follow this pattern. It's gonna be solid orange, orange and white, green, green and white, and if we flip this over on the other side, it's gonna be white and blue, blue, white and brown, and then brown. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our Cat6 cable, and we're gonna try and get these wires lined up a little bit. Like you see how the blue is kinda of lining up with the blue section, brown's kind of lining up with the brown. And then you just put that jacket right on the end of the connector, push it in there a little bit. And then we're just gonna follow this pattern here. So, just trying to make sure you guys got a good view here. Which you should. So first off is white and blue. Blue. White and brown. 
and then brown. And those wires just kind of fit down in the slots like so. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take our punch down tool. And if you look at this punch down tool, one side of the punch down tool has a point and it actually says cut. I don't know if you could see that. So on the side of the punch down tool that says cut, that is the side that's going to be away from the main uh, wire, Cat6 wire feeding into this connector. So the cut side is always going to be on the outside. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this down on a solid surface. I'm working on a glass table right now. I want to make sure that I'm not going directly on the glass. So I'm going to take the cut side and I'm going to start at the end of the connector. So I'm going to take the cut side. Cut side is going to be on the outside. And I'm just going to push down in the slot like so. And then wiggle it a little bit. And then this brown wire should twist right off. Sometimes they cut right off. So there's the brown wire. Now I'm going to do brown and white. See that wire came right out. I'm going to move on to blue. <clears throat> Reposition the wire a little bit there. There's no rush. You can take your time here. There's the blue. Then white and blue. And if it doesn't fall off completely, don't be worried. So we have this one side of the connector done. Now we need to go back to the other side. And again, we're going to follow the upper line, the B line. So the B line says white and green is going to be first, then green, then white and orange, finally orange. Just like that. Beautiful. So again, I'm going to take my punch down tool. Again, starting with the wire furthest away from the main body of wire. Start at the end. Orange. White and orange. Green. And white and green. I would definitely prefer a spring-loaded punch-down tool, but this just came in a kit and it was just convenient. So that is what the keystone jack should look like after you are finished punching it down. Now the final thing that you need to do is take your dust cover, and this just clips over the keystone jack like so. Normally doesn't matter which way you put it. And then all you do is take your wall plate and then this just snaps in the wall plate with this little spring clip right here. There we go. And that is what your finished wall plate connector should look like. Beautiful. All right, so I had to finish up the terminations on the first run of cable, then I had to do a second run following the exact same path that I just made going out to the garage, and then I would also actually like to do a small third run going from this central port right here to the utility room. That way when I hook up my camera system, I have a pre-run wire going to the utility room so I can keep an eye on the boiler when I'm not home because I get kind of concerned, kind of concerned with an oil-fired burner and me not being home. It's, it's just nice to have eyes on things like that. So if you want to test out your cable and just make sure that you did everything properly and that it's functioning as it should, what you can do, you don't have to buy those expensive testers. All you need to do is take this cable and plug it in between your modem and router and then give it a second for the router to reconnect to the modem and then just see if your internet's working properly. And if it is, then you made your first patch cable. Congratulations. So I got a lot more work to do and I will check back in with you guys after I finish everything up and everything's all tied in and then I'm going to have to figure out how to reprogram my old router 
to piggyback off my new router. So, we're getting there. So I finished up this project yesterday, had about 15 hours into it, and everything's all hooked up. And it's working as it should, so I'm just going to go over everything a little bit. Of course, i got to do some touch-ups right here. This, uh, this picture actually came down and scratched up the wall, almost came down on my head, so I've got to throw a little spackle there. I'm going to take this plate back off. I can still see the pencil line, so I'll throw a little bit of paint there. But basically what I have here is I have a four-port CAT6 junction box, if you will. Now, behind the wall, each of the wires that I ran to these three ports, the fourth one is vacant. These three wires are labeled, so if I'm ever curious which wire goes where, I just need to pull this cover plate off, and then I can identify on each individual wire where it's routed to, as well as an, an identifying number. So the top left port, this is a network line that goes directly to the garage. The port to the right here, this is going to be for a future PoE home surveillance system. The bottom left port, that is a line that I ran to the utility room. That way, uh, when I do install the PoE home surveillance system, I have a jack ready to go for the camera in the utility room. And then finally, the bottom right port is vacant for now and leaves me a little bit of room for expansion and I could always throw, a, I think they make these cover plates in six ports or I could always add another box to the left here. All right, so let's go over this whole system real quick. So this is the coax cable that connects the modem to the outside world. And then from there, this modem connects to the router. This is my main router and this is in the central location of the house. So this is how we get our Wi-Fi. Now built into this router is a firewall, so that just helps to prevent hackers from getting in the system. Now on the back side of this router, you will see that there are four yellow ports. And basically what I've done is I've taken one of those yellow ports and I have ran it via this blue networking cable into this plug right here. Now this plug goes to the garage and this is my home network cable. So that home network cable comes all the way from the other side of the house, goes underneath the floor. I think I showed you how I ran all those cables. Anyway, it comes out in the garage right here. And I put this split loom, um, yeah, it's just called split loom conduit or whatever it's called. I think split wire loom, I, I think is what it's really called. But anyway, the home network line as well as the future home surveillance line comes out right here and if you follow that wire loom goes around over here and I tried to do this as clean as possible without putting a bunch of holes in the walls uh, as you can see there was some other conduit and stuff run through there anyway but those lines come up right here and it goes to right here so this line right here is for the future home surveillance system, so that's not being used right now, but it's labeled. Not the neatest labels, but it, not the neatest labels, but it is labeled. And then the other line, the home network line, which comes off my main router, goes into this device right here. And this is called a PoE network switch. And I think I've explained this once already, but this basically just takes the line coming off the router and it injects power into that line to increase signal strength and additionally I take that internet from the main router and then it gets dispersed through these other ports right here. And here's what I've done. I've actually taken an old router and I've actually reprogrammed this to work in conjunction with the other main router. So I'm not even going to bother trying to explain how I reprogrammed it. It was a little bit complex. I will leave a link in the description of the gentleman I watched that taught me how to do the reprogramming on a Mac because I, I use Macs, not a PC guy, but you can also do it on PC. There's plenty of videos out there that will teach you how to program an old router to work with a main router. So you basically have, you know, expanded coverage of your wireless network. So yeah, not many people teach you how to do that with Mac. So that's what that looks like. It's working flawlessly. Now I have Wi-Fi in the garage as well as the upstairs, but I can always stretch an Ethernet cable from one of these other 
PoE ports and then I can just hardwire it to my laptop or any anything that I want to connect to the internet or I can run a cable directly up the wall and up to the space above the garage if I want to do that. I'm absolutely exhausted. Probably 15 hours straight of working on this project yesterday. Running those lines through all the joists by yourself, it's, it's a lot of work. But there is one major good thing that came out of doing this project besides, of course, expanding my home network. While I was in the crawl space in the basement, I noticed that there was a little bit of moisture on the concrete slab down there. And I traced it back to a drain pipe that connects to the toilet over by the garage. So that needs a new wax seal. So that's what I'm going to do next. Anyway, thanks for watching. I got some crappy work ahead of me. But I'll catch you on the next one. Any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. I'll leave links in the description, as always, to the products that I've used in this video, where you can buy the line, where you can buy the tools that I bought, so on and so forth, the network switch. And uh, as mentioned earlier, I'll also leave a link in the description to the video that I watched on how to reprogram an old router to be used in conjunction with your main router. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.